fine. And then let's try to connect. Okay. There we are. Okay. Uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Peter Erwin. Uh, those of you who are working in uh, Galactic Dynamics, uh, you know at least the name, maybe not him personally. Now you have also the opportunity to see him as well. And uh, well, uh, let me say, say just a few words. Peter finished his PhD in the States, in uh, Wisconsin, and with uh, the advisor was Linda Spark. However, his career uh, is in, in Europe. Uh, more than 10 years, uh, 15 years or so, Peter, now you are at uh, in Garching at the Max Planck for Extraterrestrial Physics. Uh, he's an expert on uh, um, on uh, galactic bars, especially the central bars, something that is very interesting for many of us here. And uh, today the, the talk will be about composite bulges a partial zoology of the beasts that live inside disks. And we we are very glad that you will be giving this talk for us, the seminar, Peter. And uh, we are looking forward for listening to the talk. So uh, if there are questions, uh, people may interrupt you, then I will stand up from the chair that is next to, to this uh, laptop and uh, come to tell you. Okay, so we start. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I'd like to talk about um, what our current picture, somewhat incomplete, but but kind of interestingly new and, and a bit dramatic about the centers of disk galaxies. So to begin with, I'd like to show this, this classic, if probably very misleading picture of what bulges are. This is the Sombrero galaxy. You can see the nearly edge on disk and this very round, fuzzy collection of stars near the center, which is which is sort of a, a prototypical, if again, maybe misleading bulge. So what is the traditional picture of bulges inside disks? Well, the idea is that galaxies consist of two components. You have the disk, which is round and flat, hence disk-like. It has an exponential surface brightness profile. Uh, it has made up of both young and old stars, along with gas, usually gas and dust. And it is kinematically cool, which is to say the stars have ordered nearly circular orbits around the center. And in this, I don't know if you can see my um, <clears throat> cursor, there's the, the this galaxy here, the, the disk is oriented sort of diagonally. It, it's seen in an intermediate inclination, so it's kind of an elliptical structure. And then there's a bar, and then in the middle, you have this, this higher surface brightness structure, which is the bulge. And this is supposed to be a spheroidal or mildly triaxial structure made up of old stars. It has a surface brightness profile, which is traditionally a de Vaucouleurs, mm -hmm. one quarter, slightly more modern is to say, well, it's a Sersich profile. And it's thought to form by, by a, some sort of early merger process. And in particular, it's kinematically hot. So there's some, usually some rot bulk rotation of the stars, but they're dominated by random motions. And in this sense, it's kind of like a small elliptical galaxy sitting inside the disk. And in the right-hand plot, you can see a surface brightness profile of this galaxy and a traditional bulge disk decomposition. So we have the dashed diagonal line is an exponential fit to the outer disk. And then the curved dashed line is a Sersich fit for the bulge. However, um, we have learned that not all bulges in disk galaxies are actually uh, like small elliptical galaxies. This is M33, um, one of our nearest neighbors. And if you look at the surface brightness profile on the right, you can see that there is a kind of, there's a lovely diagonal disk with maybe a sort of a truncation out here. And then there is central excess in here, the inner 100 parsecs or, 100 parsecs or so, which we would normally call a disk. Um, but if you look at the central 100 parsecs or so, it's full of spiral structure, spiral arms. There's lots of star formation. The isophotes are as flattened as the outer disk. So it looks like a continuation of the disk. And so this has led to the idea of pseudo bulges, which was pioneered by John Cormandy back in the 80s and 90s. And the idea is that in some cases, the bulge in a, in a disk galaxy has an exponential or nearly exponential profile. It's young stellar populations. 
It has disc phenomena like spiral arms, rings, inner bars. It has a highly flattened geometry and it can have disc-like stellar kinematics that is dominated by rotation, not by dispersion. And these have been called pseudo bulges. Um, and the idea is that their formation must be rather different from, from what are what are come to be called classical bulges, which are the spheroids I was talking about earlier. So some sort of maybe some sort of bar-driven gas inflow followed by star formation in a nuclear disk, something like that. So this is kind of the new paradigm for disk galaxies, which says, well, there's still sort of uh, a disk, which is exponential. Um, but in the center, you find either a classical bulge, spheroidal, kinematic, or one of these disk-like pseudobulges. But still, you can, ident you, you can do a bulge disk decomposition, and you identify what type of bulge it is based on things like the Sersich index. And you still have classical bulges, which are considered to be spheroids like elliptical galaxies. What I'm going to talk about today is an even newer paradigm, which is the idea of composite bulges. So back in 2000, this has been building for maybe 15 years or so. Back in 2005, Athana Sula argued from a theoretical point of view that you could have, in principle, at least three different components together, maybe even at the same time. You have your classical bulges, you have your disk-like bulges, one type of pseudo bulge. And then you could also have what are called boxy peanut shaped bulges. And these are the inner vertically thick part of bars. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to what those are like in, in just a moment. Recent observations have suggested that this sort of thing is true of real galaxies as well. You can have multiple components in the centers of disk galaxies. But what we would like to know is how common is this sort of scenario? Um, how many different components can you have in the middle of a galaxy? What are their relative sizes, masses, what are their stellar kinematics like, maybe the population? And you know, what does this have to do? What, what are the implications for traditional bulges decompositions? So let me take a brief detour and talk about um, the boxy peanut bulges. Uh, these have been recognized in real galaxies and in simulations as the vertically thickened inner part of a bar. So if you form a bar, then after about one or two giga years, this is a simulation from, sorry, let me, I cannot quite see the bottom of that. There we go. Athana Sula 2005, um, you have top, top down uh, views in the upper panels and then the lower, smaller panels, you have the edge on view. And the bar um, goes through a vertical thickening process, often a violent buckling. And you end up with, in the lower right, you end up with something which looks kind of like a double peanut shell. If you see it from, from the side on. And in fact, you can see these things. You don't have to look edge on. That was the traditional way they were found. But in 2013, Victor de Batista and I showed um, that you could see these in moderately inclined galaxies as well, because they produced a characteristic shape in the isotopes, which is this combination of a boxy or sometimes just oval, thick oval zone in the middle, and then thinner spurs projecting out on either side, usually offset. And this is an example of a comparison between an n-body simulation that formed a boxy a bar with a boxy peanut bulge. And these are the top panels. And what we've done is we've taken this and we've rotated so it has an inclination of about 60 degrees, and then we've produced a view of it. The red isophotes outline the projection of the vertically thick boxy peanut bulge. The green isophotes outline the, thin, the, the outer vertically thin part of the bar. And all we've done is we've just rotated the bar relative to the major axis of the disk as we go from left to right. That's what the delta PA shows. And then the bottom are four real galaxies with inclination, with similar inclinations and similar bar position. And so you can see that there is this characteristic change in how these outer green thins regions, the spurs, are relative to the inner boxier red regions, which is the projection of the boxy peanut bulge. The important thing is this allows us to identify when there's a boxy peanut bulge present in a galaxy just from the morphology. Okay, back to bulges in general. Why, why should we care how many kinds of things there are in the centers of galaxies? Well, 
The Hubble sequence is partly a sequence of bulge to total ratio. That is how much of the light in the galaxy is part of the bulge. So we'd like, if you want to understand the Hubble sequence, you kind of need to understand bulges. And increasingly, the idea of bulge sizes and masses and the fraction of the total galaxy that is in the bulge has become really important for galaxy evolution. It's a key prediction of both semi-analytic and cosmological n-body hydrodynamical simulations. Um, there's a lot of observational evidence that the quenching of star-forming galaxies is strongly associated with the presence or masses of bulges. So galaxies with large bulge to total ratios are more likely to be quenched. Um, there's also just a ton of observational studies doing simple bulge decompositions. The galaxy is an exponential disk plus a Sersich bulge for tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of galaxies. Uh, finally, we also know that supermassive black holes seem to correlate quite strongly with bulge properties, particularly this velocity dispersion and the luminosity or stellar mass of the bulge. So if you want to know what's going on with bulges and what the you know, what bulge to total actually means, you need to understand what bulges actually are and how they form. So these are some of the things we'd like to know in this context. We'd like to know how many different distinct stellar components there actually are in the inner regions of disk galaxies. Some of the possibilities include bars, including often boxy peanut bulges, um, inner bars, as in you would find in a double barred galaxy, Nuclear disks, which is kind of the, the, the stereotypical idea of a pseudo-bulge. Nuclear rings, uh, classical bulges, assuming they exist, and maybe other things we're not, we, we hadn't really been aware of. We'd like to know how many of these things coexist in galaxies and what their relative sizes and masses are, their stellar kinematics, populations, and so forth. So to address this, we've put together something we call the Composite Bulges Survey. Um, this is... Uh, th these are some of the co-authors, including uh, people at MPE, University of Utah, uh, other places in the US, the UK, even Australia. And what we've done is what we've done is we've defined a sample of about 50 galaxies. So this is a volume and a mass limited survey of early and intermediate type disk galaxies. So we've restricted ourselves to relatively massive galaxies. 10 to them solar masses are larger. Um, Hubble types of S0 through SBC, which is where you expect. Is that, a, is, there, sorry, is there a question? No, uh, so, someone has uh, not muted. And oh, okay. I don't know exactly from maybe. Uh, from, okay, okay. Now we are. Okay. And in particular, we have a distance limit of 20 megaparsecs because we want to have really good spatial resolution. Uh, we don't want to be conf confused, but because we can't tell, we have no resolution of, of, let's say, the inner kiloparsec. We restrict this to moderate inclinations between about 35 and 65 degrees. The reason is that if you have face on galaxies, you can't really get a good velocity field for the stars. And it's also hard to determine the thickness of a structure because a circular disk and a circular uh, sphere, well, I, I should say, from the face on point of view, you, you can't tell them apart. And if you have edge-on galaxies, um, it gets really hard to tell what's going on because all of your two-dimensional information for the disk is compressed along the line of sight. So we have about 53 southern accessible disk galaxies. And we say southern accessible because we want to observe them with MUSE on the VLT. We have HS Hubble Space Telescope imaging for all of the galaxies in the optical and in particular the near-infrared. F-160W, which is basically H-band. Um, we want, this gives us spatial resolution of 10 parsecs or better for all of our galaxies. We also have large scale near infrared images, mostly from Spitzer. Um, and this is because the, we want to model, ideally we want to model the entire galaxy. If you're trying, if you're doing decompositions, then the, the modeling of your, the inner part of the galaxy is partly affected by how you're modeling the rest of the galaxy. So we want to be able to see what the entire disk of the galaxy is doing. And we also need this because we want to determine, we want to remove the background from the HST images. And these galaxies are big enough that they fill the HST field with view. So 
that's why we need the, the larger scale images. We are also in the process of getting Muse integral field spectroscopy for uh, the central few kiloparsecs of these galaxies. We've observed, there, there are 41 that have data, 30 that we've observed and 11 more from other surveys. Um, it's still incomplete. There's the potential for another six galaxies that we have time awarded for, we're applying for the rest. The point of, of the MUSE data is to get the stellar kinematics and the velocity fields and later on population, stellar populations. Um, we're also looking at the gas kinematics, although that's kind of a, a separate issue. So one of the main things we're doing is we're doing image decompositions of the galaxies and we're using, uh, we do this, we fit a 2D model to the large scale image of the entire galaxy and then also to the high resolution HST image of the galaxy center. We use this using a code called IMFIT, which is, I think, the fastest code available. Uh, it allows you to have multiple components, multiple different centers. You can add new components. Uh, there's bootstrap resampling and markup chain Monte Carlo if you want to get better uh, errors. Uh, there's even a new Python interface. It's open source. I encourage you to, to check it out. Okay. So let me start off by, by doing a detailed analysis of two galaxies from our sample. And <clears throat> I, I'm doing this partly, partly because we've already published this analysis where you can read about it in Urban and All 2021. But it's interesting as an example of two galaxies which at, on the large scale look very, very similar and yet turn out to have rather different central structures. So NGC 4608. You know, these are a, near, near infrared observations, right? Well, what I'm showing you, the, the pictures I'm showing you are actually Sloan Digital Sky Survey optical images. Okay, I see. But I will be talking about our analysis of the near infrared images. Okay. Okay, so NGC 4608, BARD S0, Virgo cluster, really inclination between about 35 and 40 degrees, really strong bar, round center. So naively, you would say, okay, there's a big bulge in this galaxy. And the other one is a field S barred S0A, similar inclination, similar strong bar, similar round center. If you do a naive, what I would call a naive bulge disk decomposition, just exponential disk plus Sarasich bulge, then these are very bulge dominated galaxies. Bulge a total of 0.49 or 0.65. Um, so you would say, yeah, okay, bul very bulge dominated galaxies. Okay, start off with NGC 4608. This is the, the S0 galaxy. So the upper two panels show you the Spitzer IRAG-1 images. This is 3.6 microns. The bottom two panels show our best fitting model for the image. And this includes uh, an outer disk, which is basically, which is a broken exponential profile that is a shallow, inner exponential, and then beyond a break radius, it has a steeper fall off with a steeper exponential. There is an inner ring, which is sort of forms this partial ring shape here. There is a bar, which is actually a two component system, which I'll discuss in the next slide. And then finally, well, there's a very round Sershich component, which we're naively calling a classical bulge at this stage. And I will note that this, this decomposition is actually really similar to one that was done by Athanasu et al. 2015 for a K-band image. Okay, what do we mean by a two-component bulge? Well, remember I was talking about boxy peanut bulges. This is the vertically thick inner part of a bar. Traditionally, when people model bars in 2D image decompositions, they treat the bar as a single component, a sersich, an elliptical sersich with a low N or sometimes a Ferrer's ellipsoid. But what we now understand is that if you have a boxy peanut bulge, not only is that vertically thicker, it has a steeper surface brightness profile. So what we do is we model the bar as having two components. That is a flat outer part with a shallow surface brightness profile and the steeper inner part, which corresponds to the boxy peanut bulge. And in our case, that looks like this. So on the left, you see what we call the flat bar component, which is very elliptical, slightly boxy outer isophotes, shallow surface brightness profile along the major axis. 
and then a rounder or even boxy sersich shape which is smaller and dominates the inner part of the light and that represents the boxy peanut bulge and the sum of them put together looks like this so now i'm going to zoom in on our model so now we're looking at the hst f160w or h band image the top panels show the data the bottom panels show the model and so what you can see is that this so we're 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 keeping the outer disk model the same this is our broken exponential outer disk there's the inner ring again and then the bar is this the thin outer part here is from the flat bar component and then the round the the, the more oval region in here is from the sersich component which we think corresponds to the box of peanut bulge we also still have a, a very round central sersich component which we're calling a classical bulge and in addition the hst data lets us see that there is a there is a compact nuclear star cluster in this galaxy Okay, that seems fairly straightforward. Let's look at the other galaxy. NGC 4643, going back to the Spitzer 3.6 micron image. So we fit the, the main disk we find fits with a broken exponential profile. So similar to 4608. The bar, we, we don't really find uh, an inner ring, but for the bar, we find a very similar structure. We, we fit it best with the same two component model, the flat bar plus the, the inner rounder boxy peanut. Now there's an essential component, um, which is, you can see right in here, and we're call, temporarily calling this a nuclear disk. The thing to notice is that it's not very round. It is actually slightly elliptical. The orientation is actually almost perpendicular to the bar. And it has a similar orientation as the main disk of the galaxy. And in fact, this has turned out to be very similar to Laura Kain et al, 2014, doing a decomposition of a K-band image of the same galaxy. Now let's zoom in and look at the HST data for this galaxy. So again, data on the top panels, model in the bottom panels. So we have the same outer disk model, we have the same bar model. The interesting thing is that for the nuclear, for what we think is a nuclear disk, we find it's actually not a simple exponential structure. We get a much better fit if we give it a broken exponential profile. And if we look up here in the upper right panel, you can see in this region in here between about, let's say, two and five arc seconds, the isophotes are closely spaced together. That's the steep outer part, the steep outer exponential. And then as you get closer to the center, the inner two arc seconds, two to three arc seconds, you get wider spacing between the isophotes. This means there's a shallower surface brightness profile. And then again, and finally, there is a, there is a small central excess which we're call, which we're a little bit uncertain of. We 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 alternate between calling this a very small classical bulge or a very large nuclear star cluster. So this is an interesting difference, and I'm going to concentrate on the central region of both galaxies. So what the upper panels show is the isophotes is of the data. If you subtract off all the large scale stuff, you subtract off the disk, you subtract off the bar, and you look at what's left. So in 4608, we have this very round region with uh, a sersich profile with an N of about two and then a tiny little nuclear star cluster. So the bottom panel just shows the major axis profile along this dashed line. 4643 has a significantly more elliptical structure with a steep outer profile and a shallow inner profile. And so you can see in the major axis profile at the bottom, you can see there's a steep outer part, and then in around three arc seconds, it breaks to a shallower profile. So even though the galaxies are almost identical on the large scale, in the inner region, they're actually quite different. Now, can we tell what's going on with the stellar kinematics? Well, to a certain degree, we can. I would love to show you the MUSE data for NGC 4608 because we just got some um, two nights ago, in fact. It was observed with the VLT. Unfortunately, that means that it hasn't been reduced yet, so I can't show you that data. Um, however, this was observed with, with Sauron as part of the Atlas 3D survey, so I can show you that data, which is which is pretty good for, this, for these purposes. So here's the central region of NGC 4608 showing the inner part of the bar, and overlaid on that is the velocity fields from Atlas 3D. So we have the, veloc the stellar velocity, 
we have the velocity dispersion, uh, the, the sort of overall random motion. And then we have the H3 and H4 Gauss Hermite moments. And these basically tell you H3 is the skew, which tells you how the, the line of sight velocity distribution deviates in, an, in a non-axisymmetric way. And the H4, which is the kurtosis, which tells you about symmetric deviations. And the main thing that I want to point out here is that you have, okay, you've got rotation. As you go in towards the center, when you get to the region where, where what we think there is a classical bulge, there's not a lot of rotation. Um, but the velocity dispersion keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And this is what you would expect for naively for a classical bulge, the kinematically hot system that dominates the center of the galaxy, little, little to no rotation. Okay. Now, NGC 4643, um, the upper panels, This, in this case, we have VLT Muse data, which is actually taken as part of the timer project. Um, so what we've done is we've re-reduced, reanalyzed, re redone the stellar kinematics um, using the PPXF code, if you're curious about those details. So the middle panel up here shows you the Muse field of view. And then on the right, we have a zoom into the nuclear disk region. So we have the velocity, the dispersion, H3, H4. Um, so a couple things to note in the, we have uh, overall stellar rotation. Uh, we have velocity dispersion that gets higher towards the center. And in fact, it does so in a very oval fashion. And it does, it matches what we think is the boxy peanut bulge. So the boxy peanut bulge is showing up as a region of, of an, as an elliptical region of higher dispersion. Okay. Now, if we zoom in on the center, and that's what the box is doing, and the oval in the, in the lower panel shows you the approximate location of the new, what we call the nuclear disk, you can see there's high, there's high rotation and there's low dispersion. In fact, if you look up here, you can see there's like, it's like someone took a kind of elliptical cookie cutter and just stamped the center of the, the velocity dispersion. So there's just this striking elliptical zone of lower dispersion. So rapid rotation, low dispersion. If you look at the H3, you can see that there's this beautiful match between the negative H3 in blue, positive velocity in red. Positive H3 in red, negative velocities blue. This is velocity H3 anti-correlation, and it is the signature of axisymmetric stellar rotation. You see this for large scale disks all the time. You see it for rapidly rotating elliptical galaxies too. So this tells us that the inner zone here is rapidly rotating, lower dispersion, axisymmetric rotation. It's a, it's, it's very, very disk-like. The final thing is over here, this is the H4. So this is the kurtosis. And the curious thing is that we have a region of very hot, very positive H4. In fact, it's a ring region. It goes down a little bit towards the center. We think, and I will show you more evidence for this later, that what's going on is this is because the nuclear disk does not replace the boxy peanut bulge. The boxy peanut bulge is probably extending in towards the center of the galaxy. It's just coexisting with the nuclear disk. The nuclear disk is in the plane. So if we look on, here's the nuclear disk, the boxy peanut bulge is vertically thick. It extends outside the plane. So in this region, we're seeing the overlap of the stellar kinematics from the nuclear disk, rapid rotation, low dispersion, and the stellar kinematics from the boxy peanut bulge, lower rotation, higher dispersion, and that will give you a high H4. So kinematically, we seem to see an overlap, just as we our decomposition suggested an overlap. So to kind of summarize this you know, detailed exploration of these two galaxies, NGC 4608 has a small classical bulge uh, inside the boxy peanut bulge of the bar with a nuclear star cluster. This classical bulge of total ratio is only about 12%. NGC 4643 has a kinematically cool nuclear disk with a slightly unusual broken exponential profile inside the boxy peanut bulge and a very small classical bulge or large nuclear star cluster. The nuclear disk is about 13% of the total light, basically the same as the classical bulge in 4608. Okay, so let me move on to what we've learned so far from the entire sample. We haven't finished analyzing the whole sample. We've got about 75 to 80% of it done in terms of image modeling and also in terms of the stellar kinematic data. So 
I'm going to talk about three main structures that we see. We see boxy peanut bulges, the inner part of the boa. We see nuclear disks, and we identify these as having shapes similar to the outer disk or clearly disk-like substructure, nuclear rings and bars, um, and or the fact that it's kinematically cooler than the surrounding part of the disk or, or the boxy peanut bulge of the bar. Uh, classical bulges, which are rounder than the main disk and kinematically hotter. Uh, we also find nuclear star clusters, nuclear rings, and inner bars, although, although we won't talk about them very much. So, BP bulges. So far, almost all the bars have BP bulges. And this is actually consistent with what we know for, for more general samples. So, uh, Erwin and De Petitza, 2017, a couple other papers. The lower right panel shows uh, Erwin, De Petitza, and Anderson, which is currently being refereed. This shows you the fraction of bars which have boxy peanut bulges as a function of galaxy stellar mass. And the striking thing is that for very for low mass galaxies, the bars almost never have boxy peanut bulges. And for high mass galaxies, the bars almost always have boxy peanut bulges. Anyway, in the composite bulges survey, we find that, that BP bulges have Gaussian to exponential surface brightness profiles. And the fraction of the total cell light is anywhere from, let's say, two and a half percent to over slightly over fifty percent, with a mean of about fourteen percent, which tends to be a little bit larger than the other components. Okay, let's talk about nuclear disks. We find nuclear disks in slightly more than half the galaxies. Um, the fraction of stellar light is between about two and a half and seventeen percent, to the mean of about nine percent. So a little smaller than the BP bulges. Um, we usually find a clear signature of stellar kin kinematics, like I showed you for NGC 4643. The fast rotation, the anti-correlation between velocity and H3, lower dispersion, and rings of positive H4, of, of positive kurtosis. Most of these have exponential or quasi-exponential profiles. If we fit them with a Sarasitch, we get a median of around n of around 1.2, where n of 1 is exponential. But there are five galaxies, which are like NGC 4643, where there is a nuclear disk with a broken exponential profile. And in the left panel, I'm showing you 4643 again. In the right panel, I'm showing you 3351, which is a spiral galaxy with a massively star-forming nuclear ring, which is why you have sort of a me messier isophotes and all these little peaks in here. But in fact, the underlying structure is shows a steep outer fall off and a shallow inner zone. This is again, what I've done is I've subtracted off the disc and the bar from the galaxy. So this is peculiar. We don't really know why this is the case. Um, now, the main disks of galaxies often have profiles like these so-called type two or truncated profiles. But those are usually thought to be something to do with star formation thresholds. It's not clear that that has anything to do with what's going on in these nuclear disks. OK, um, let me talk briefly about getting a little more detail out of the kinematics. So we're going back to NGC 4643. And the right-hand stuff I've shown you before, this is the large, this is the full Muse field of view. And this is the bottom panel. This is zooming in on the uh, central nuclear the, the nuclear disk region we have some new code which instead of giving us v sigma h3 and h4 gives us the whole line of sight velocity distribution so that's what these little black circles with error bars are this is the losv this is a non-parametric losvd of this particular region here in the in the kind of upper left part of the nuclear disk region and we can what we, once we've got this, we can try fitting it with our hypothesis is we've got a nuclear disk, low dispersion, high velocity, and a boxy peanut bulge, low velocity, high dispersion. So we want to see if we can fit the LOSVD with these two components. And that's what's going on in the right in the left-hand panel. The red, the broad red is the BP bulge component, low velocity, high dispersion, 200, almost 270 kilometers per second. The narrow blue structure is the nuclear disk component, higher velocity, low dispersion, only about 80 kilometers per second. And you can see it actually does a pretty good job of matching the data. Now, the neat thing about this is that we can do, we can then in the left-hand panels, we can look at the individual 
components. So the upper two panels are the velocity and the dispersion of the nuclear disk component from our decomposition. Rapid rotation, low dispersion. In fact, if you measure velocity along the major axis and divide it by the local value of dispersion, then in the full data set from the PPXF analysis, you get a Vmax or a sigma of 1.4. But using just this component from our decomposition, it goes up to 2.1. So it tells you that the disk is more rapidly, is kinematically cooler than you would naively think from just looking at the total 2D velocity fields. And again, the BP bulge down at the bottom here has some rotation, but not much, but higher dispersion. Now, the other thing, and unfortunately I can't show you the animation, which makes this a little bit clearer, but this is a plot of the nuclear disk region. And this is the relative weight of the two different components. The dark points, the dark blue points and the, the filled red circles are from the kinematics. So this is from the 2D co composition. The lighter open symbols are from the photometric decomposition, from our an analysis of the HST image. And the main point here is that they basically show the same thing. They show the BP bulge component has a very shallow profile, which dominates at around seven arc seconds, but is subdominant in the center. And then the nuclear disk component has a steeper profile. In fact, it's a broken exponential profile, which dominates in the inner region. And the thing is, we get the same result from the kinematic decomposition as we get from the photometric decomposition, which is really kind of neat. Okay, back to nuclear disks in general. Um, what do they look like? What, what are their shapes? So this shows you two different ways of looking at this. The left-hand panel shows you the position angle of the nuclear disk relative to the bar. That's on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it shows you the position angle of the nuclear disk relative to the main disk of the galaxy. And the point to notice here is that the, nu the, th the nuclear disks are basically aligned with the main disk to within about, let's say, 5 or at most 10 degrees. This is consistent with there being axis with the, there being axisymmetric structures that have the same orientation as the main disk of the galaxy. On the other hand, they seem to have random angles with respect to the, the bar. Now, this is interesting because one explanation of what is what are the nuclear disk stars doing is from the standpoint of bar dynamics, um, there are the X2 orbits, which are perpendicular to the bar in a bar in a rotating barred potential. So you might expect nuclear disks to follow these orbits and therefore to be intrinsically a bit elliptical and perpendicular to the bar. We don't really see that. They seem to be round axisymmetric structures. Now, the second thing is in the right-hand panel, which shows on the x-axis the observed, the ellipticity of the main disk component. So this is how high a proxy for how highly inclined the disk is, assuming it's round, round and flat. And the y-axis, we show the ellipticity of the nuclear disk component. If they had the same orientation and the same flattening, you would, exceed, you would expect to see them clustered around the one-to-one -one line, which is the gray diagonal. In fact, although there are some that are close to it, on average, they tend to be a bit below this line. This means that they are, in projection, a bit rounder which suggests they may be vertically thicker than the main disk in the galaxy. Uh, let me skip over the nuclear star clusters, although this is just shows you the, a size mass relation for nuclear star clusters. The little, the, the little points are from the literature. The big points, circles and squares, are from our analysis by as part of Ashwari Ashok's PhD thesis. And basically what we're finding is that they, they look like nuclear star clusters in other galaxies, which is kind of reassuring. Finally, let me talk about the classical bulges. Um, these are, again, these are things that are supposed to be spheroidal, kinematically hot. Um, so far, only about 21% of the galaxies have what we would call probable classical bulges, kinematically hot systems. Now, there's another 19% of the galaxies that have ambiguous components, and I'll get into what those are. These are things which are around the main disk, and they don't have any obvious disk-like features like nuclear bars or nuclear rings, but we don't really know the kinematics very well or at all. Or at all. Anyway, so the fraction of stellar light is between about two and a half and 30%, the mean of about 13%. So it's a little larger, but it's similar to the nuclear disk and it's a little bit less than the BP bulges. 
And the serocytin indices range between about one and three, or even one and four. Okay, what do you mean by ambiguous objects? So this is a plot of nuclear disks, classical bulges, and these ambiguous structures. So on the x-axis is the main disk ellipticity. Um, and then the vertical axis is the ellipticity, the observed ellipticity of the individual components. So the blue circles are the, nu the, the nuclear disks that I showed you from before. The red circles are the things that we think are kinematically hot classical bulges, unambiguous. Uh, and here's NGC 4608 down here. NGC 4371 has both. It has a small hot structure we think is a classical bulge and a larger kinematically cool structure we're calling a nuclear disk. And then there are these gray circles. And gray circles are things where we don't really, there, there isn't any clear evidence for disky morphology, like nuclear rings or nuclear bars. Um, but we don't really know about the stellar kinematics very well or, or at all. And you'll notice they're clustering below, but they're overlapping with the nuclear disk. In fact, some of the classical bulges are overlapping with the nuclear disks. So there's something funny going on where nuclear disks and classical bulges seem to be overlapping in some sense. Maybe some of the nuclear disks are thick and kinematically warm, so to speak. Um, it's not really clear that there's, there's, there isn't really a clear separation that you might expect. Um, I can also talk about the classical bulges in the context of the nuclear star cluster. So this is a size mass plot. And the small open circles are nuclear star clusters from the literature. The big filled black circles are our nuclear star clusters from our analysis. And then the red squares are the hot, kinematically hot classical bulges. And the open <coughs> squares are basically those ambiguous systems. And we also have the, the nuclear disks plotted in here. And one other thing I've shown is that there's, a, there's an additional sort of category of the ambiguous structures which are possibly the boxy peanut bulges of nuclear or inner bars, which if you like, you can ask me about and I can go into, I can go into those a little bit more. But the main thing I want to point out here is this is kind of a continuous sequence. And there's a funny thing where it's not clear that you can draw a distinction between, okay, nuclear star clusters are always small, classical bulges or similar things are always large. There might be a continuum in size. So here is a summary of what we found so far. Uh, nuclear star clusters, classical bulges, ambiguous structures, nuclear disks, and then some of the subcomponents like inner bars, nuclear rings, and the boxy peanut bulges. So nuclear star clusters are very common, as are boxy peanut bulges. Classical bulges are pretty rare. Nuclear disks are pretty common. This is the median fraction of the total galaxy light in these different components. So classical bulges, 10% nuclear disks, 8% BP bulges, 10%. These are the median sizes. Classical bulges, let's say 245 parsecs, nuclear disks, 275 parsecs, BP bulges, 700 parsecs. So the classical bulges and the nuclear disks are kind of similarly sized, and the classical bulges, nuclear disks, and BP bulges are a similar fraction of the galaxy light. And most galaxies have both a BP bulge and either a nuclear disk or a classical bulge, and usually a nuclear star cluster. That's the most common scenario. We've only found one galaxy so far that has both a nuclear disk and a classical bulge. And we have only found one galaxy so far that has just a classical bulge and a disk and a star cluster. Um, finally, uh, we can look at what, what does this mean for bulges decompositions? Remember, there are lots and lots of studies they're doing simple bulges decompositions, treating every galaxy as having just a, an exponential disk and a serocyte bulge. So we did that for our galaxies, and that's what the x-axis is. This is the bulge to total that we get from treating the galaxies having just, the whole galaxy is having just two components. And you see it ranges all the way from maybe 5% to 80%, okay? And again, these are early type, these are S0 through SBC, so this isn't really all that unexpected. but 
in the y-axis, we're plotting the bulk, the, the, the component to total value for all those individual components. The classical bulges, red circles, the nuclear disks, blue circles, uh, the ambiguous structures, gray circles, the BP bulges, open squares. And you can see there's basically, if you wanted to say, okay, classical bulges are spheroids, do naive bulge decompositions tell us about spheroids? And the answer is no, they don't. Because you know we have a spheroid that's only 10% of the total galaxy, and yet the naive decomposition says it's over 70%. 2D the naive two-component decompositions give you a very misleading picture of what's going on in the centers of galaxies. Okay, so to summarize, the central regions of S0 through SBC galaxies, what, what might be called the photometric bulges, are usually not a single structure. Instead, there are at least two, sometimes more, substructures. The most common situation is the BP bulge of the bar and either a nuclear disk or a classical bulge. And then in both cases, there's usually a nuclear star, nuclear star cluster inside. BP bulge is typically about 15% of the total light, nuclear disks and classical bulge is about 10%. Now, I didn't mention the Milky Way, but this actually is shows the Milky Way is pretty typical. It has a BP bulge, it has a nuclear star cluster, and it seems to have a nuclear stellar disk, although it's on the small side. It's only about 2% of the total light. And we don't know if it has a classical bulge at all. Uh, and finally, standard bullshit decompositions cannot be used to estimate spheroid fractions or mass functions. And I'll leave you with some mysteries, um, things things we, we don't know anything about that are, that are puzzling us. Why do some nuclear disks have broken exponential profiles? Are nuclear disks usually thicker than main disks? Uh, is there a continuum between nuclear disks and classical bulges? Is there a continuum between classical bulges and nuclear star clusters? And again, something I didn't, I only briefly touched on, do nuclear bars have their own BP bulges, which we're seeing some evidence for. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a summary so you can read the summary. And thanks for listening. Many thanks, uh, Peter, for this very nice talk. A lot of uh, information valuable for people that are trying to, uh, to see that in models. And of course, there is uh, time for questions. First of all, is there anyone who wants to ask something? But come closer so that we can hear. Uh, hello, I'm Mirella Harsula. I would like to ask a question. In your sample or in your simulations, have you studied at all the, any correlations between the mass of the bulges and the structure of the disk, for example, the rings or the pitch angle of the spiral arms? No, we haven't, unfortunately. Um, we're some of our uh, about forty percent of our galaxies are actually S zeros, so we wouldn't be able to tell you anything about the the, the pitch angles. Um, the rest are spirals, so in principle, we could that we we haven't looked at that at all. I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Peter. So in in the uh, if you have an adjoint galaxy, so it is totally lost case to try to separate a kind of spheroidal component from the peanut, or are there some cases where one can say that, uh, looking at an adjoint object, that uh, this is a good decomposition between uh, whatever is left over from, let's say, from the from the bar, from the thick part of the bar, and what remains is organized in a spheroidal. Do we have some cases like that? Okay, so my feeling is it's, it's it's hard for a number of reasons. One one of, is that if it's a spiral galaxy, then you magnify the effects of dust extinction by looking at it edge on. So that makes it harder to tell. And the dust is 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 always sort of is almost always denser in the center, which means which makes it even harder. Um, the second problem is that you can tell that there you can tell that there is some sort of uh, excess component which is flattened. But it's not clear how you would distinguish, let's say, a nuclear disk from a nuclear ring yeah. from a nuclear bar. Yeah. You can do that if the galaxy has a lower inclination, because you can see that, OK, this is a ring, this is a disk, this is a bar. If you look at those edge on, they, they all just sort of look like a kind of, you know, 
highly flattened structure with some sort of exponential or maybe shallow or broken exponential profile. So you could distinguish those from the BP bulge. Yes, that's something you could do. But distinguishing and then telling the difference between, you know, a compact thick nuclear disk and a small classical bulge would be, I think, really tricky. Okay. Well, even if you cannot distinguish the exact nature of uh, uh, of what remains, if you subtract, let's say, a bar, a peanut. Uh, well, okay. I, the other problem is it's hard to it's is remember that most of these are, are, are two component systems. Yeah. There's the outer vertically thin part of the bar, and there's the inner peanut. And if the <coughs> excuse me, if the bar happens to be oriented perpendicular to the line of sight. So if it's like this, yeah. then yeah. you can do that. You can say, okay, the outer part here, well, let's say the outer part, okay, that's the vertically thin part and the inner part, that's where you get, it, it gets thicker and that's the box of unit. But what if the bar is oriented close to your line of sight? Yeah. And how do you tell the difference between the vertically thin, the outer vertically thin part of the bar, which is sitting in front of the center of the galaxy yeah. and yeah. let's say a nuclear disk inside uh, that well, then I think it's a total lock okay, because even the, the the bar the peanut will in some case will be like a a, a, a round component let's say but it is exactly, <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. but, then, but uh, let, let, then if we go to inclined disk any relation between the uh the the, the, the spheroidal or even if it is a nuclear disk whatever and the strength of the peanut if you have the same, yeah. I mean that that's that's a really interesting question. We we haven't looked at that. Um, I'm not sure what the right way to measure the strength of the peanut would be. I mean, uh, we we can do it in a kind of crude, um, you know, what fraction of the stellar light is in the peanut. Okay. Okay. But because we're seeing the peanut projected at different orientations, sure, yeah. it's kind of hard to to back out from that and 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 get a kind of, you know, if you want to say how vertically thick is the peanut, that's not something we can usually do. At least I, I would love to do that. Um, what we need is a good, I think what we need is a good three-dimensional model, what the peanut is. I mean- uh, I hope in a few my, weeks my, I can show you something and you will understand the reason why I'm asking I, about okay. that. Well, I, <laughs> I have to show you actually, I don't think I need to do that right now. And a uh, final for my side question is, uh, if there is any relation, you have this uh, nearly, uh, well, this, uh, the peanuts that you detect in uh, not a John galaxies, okay, if what, uh, and some of them, most of them, are, or at least a large fraction of them are a la something like boxy, in a boxy, because it is, this is the peanut, and some others are rounder, but mm -hmm. they have also a peanut, but are rounder. Is there any relation between the dispersion of velocities in one and the other case? Uh, to my thinking, I would say uh, I'm expecting that uh, the more boxy the inner part, the stronger the the larger the dispersion velocity. Is there such a tendency? Again, not something we've looked at yet. Um, now, some of the the problem is we we we'd have to I think we'd have to isolate cases where the bar was at a similar orientation, so the projection effect. Yeah. Was 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 sort of like uh, factored out. Um, we could probably do that. I mean, our sample is about seventy five percent barred. Yeah, and about seventy five or eighty percent of the bars have boxy peanut bulges. We think. Okay. So in principle, that's something that we could maybe look at. Okay, great. So let me check if there is an, an, an anybody else who wants to ask. Not from people from that are online. There is one. So if uh, if I'm missing something, please uh, just speak. But I don't see any any hand raised. So then coming back to the audience, if there is another question, we thank Peter again. Thank you, Peter. It was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of useful information. It's good that it will be recorded and then we can check it again. <laughs> so, Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. See you in a couple of weeks uh, or uh, at least during April sometime. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.